Hi, um, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our LinkedIn Live talk uh, on the very important NIST two directive affecting a lot of uh, organizations here at EMEA and really, really globally. Uh, my, my name is Bo Ashton. I'm our, our field CTO here in EMEA, and I'm joined by Chris Hutchins. Chris? Hi, yeah, I'm Chris Hutchins. I'm responsible for government relations in uh, the EMEA region and um, have worked closely on the NIST II directive as it went through its um, legislative process. And now, of course, it's now time for compliance, both for, um, for vendors uh, and for critical infrastructure players. So excited to discuss the subject today. Yeah, but let's, get, let's get right into that conversation, Chris. So, you know, for what do you think makes this directive so important you know, for our customers or for many you know, organizations throughout uh, throughout EMEA and throughout the globe. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, a really important point, Mo. Um, organizations, you know, are, are constantly under under threat and continuous attacks, and particularly on critical infrastructure players across Europe. Uh, and I think the the EU, um, you know, was concerned about the number of attacks, uh, the effect of the attacks, and so they really wanted to do something to sort of level up cyber resilience. Um, and they also had learnings from the first NIST uh, directive from 2016. Uh, and there were some inconsistencies between countries um, about, you know, which uh, critical infrastructure players were actually in scope and had to comply with the rules. So, you know, NIST 2 was really drafted to increase, you know, cyber security and resilience across the EU as a whole. And with that in mind, you know, it's typical of an EU piece of legislation. It doesn't mandate specific security controls, but rather puts in place um, a regime for continuous risk management. Um, uh, and so a, a need for, for companies, public administrations, critical infrastructure players to consistently upgrade uh, their maturity model, um, improve incident management and information sharing. So, um, I was going to say you mentioned a couple of key points: uh, you know, resiliency, you know, continuous, you know, risk management, number of different sectors that are affected. What is that? Are those the key differences between that the first NIST and and this one? Yeah, I mean, I think what's happened is is really they they understood that the scope needed to be in, enlarged. We needed to have more entities um, who had to comply with NIST too. So there's two distinctions. There's uh, essential entities, think of energy providers, transport, banking, um, digital service providers, government agencies. And then there's important entities. Uh, think of certain manufacturers, food production, distribution. So all in all, NIST 2 compared to NIST 1 covers many, many more sectors. Um, we think it'll cover around 100,000 entities. Um, and our estimate in Germany alone is we think 45,000 organizations will, will have to comply with this, these risk management frameworks and, and obligations. That's so, amazing. Um, it's, That's a, it's got a much broader scope. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big scope, but I think, I think some of the, the things that you mentioned, you know, whether you're an organization that's you know, affected by, by the regulation, I think some of the, the principles in, uh, that are there are applicable or can be adopted by pretty much any any organization because I think they're they're I know they're trying to establish that baseline of capability in the critical sectors. But uh, if I was not a, even if I was a if I was a CISO in a, in a non critical sector, I would still be looking at this. I think. Right. I, I you know I mean it, it creates good cyber hygiene um, standards um, for all organizations. Um, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, um, learnings there that and good practices uh, in this too, which most organizations could and should adopt and adhere to. Uh, I think we'll come on to talk uh, about a few of those in, in more detail as, uh, as we move on. But um, unlike uh, NIST 1, it's, it's got more teeth this time as well. There's, uh, if, your, um, uh, if your incident uh, notification um, reporting uh, procedures are not up to scratch, or, um, you know, if they feel, the legislators feel that the, um, the directive isn't being complied with, then there are fines, a bit like GDPR. So 2% of global revenue um, for essential entities and 1.4% for 
important entities. So it's got to be taken seriously by by the C-suite um, and by, you know, executives can be held personal li personally liable for non-compliance. So it's um it's a tough piece of legislation. Okay. And the other, those, those fines will certainly get uh, a lot of attention, but I think even outside the, you know, the financial penalties, you know, the risk of cyber, you know, a cyber attack, bringing down critical infrastructure and, and even the business and the business that supports that is, uh, is also something equally, equally critical here, right? I think that's what we're trying to you know, create that resilient environment, you know, throughout, you know, throughout the EU to prevent that impact. <laughs> Right. It's it's a lot more than just about achieving compliance or avoiding fines. It's actually, you know, a foundational um, uh, framework for, you know, improving and continuously improving cybersecurity in, in every organization. So in general, we think it's it's a good piece of a piece of legislation. But maybe, Mo, I could I could turn to you. Um, you know, so we know that it captures more organizations um, and we know that it's about a continuous uh, uh, assessment of, of risk management procedures and protocols, but what for you does it mean as a practitioner? You know, what would you be advising Trellix's CISO about NIST two? What what should be thinking about uh, as we move into the compliance uh, process? Yeah, I think the, there's a couple of key things that have been through the regulation, and there's you know, there's one section there that really gives that practical guidance, that's there, their practical requirements, and you know one of those, and you mentioned it, which was using international uh, standards and frameworks to assess your maturity. And fortunately now at this at this time, uh, you have quite a few. And if I'm a CISO, if I was talking to a CISO, we, we could be talking about ISO 27001. That's certainly a baseline of, of controls and processes that uh, actually many organizations probably already comply with that, especially if you're in the financial sector or in a you know, highly regulated industry or in an essential sector. You probably already have uh, a program for ISO twenty seven thousand one compliance, so that that already gets you in the in the right in the right direction. But other frameworks, um, maybe quality standards, uh, frameworks that that govern your know, cyber controls in say the OT environment. If you're running, you know, we'll say industrial systems, uh, we call it operational technology. Could be many things. Could be manufacturing. Could be energy, oil and gas. Many many sectors run those type of you have SCADA systems. There's a framework also that governs that, i.e. I, 62553. Hopefully I got that right. It's a, it's actually a, you know, a controls framework is specific to those environments. So while you may be looking at uh, you know, ISO as your baseline, start thinking, okay, well, I've got to cover these other areas. So what, what would be a good framework to say in the industrial side? That, that framework that I mentioned is good. Uh, NIST uh, is, is really more of a... You, um, that capabilities framework, uh, and I think that's the new cybersecurity framework, which has been updated, you know, it's very very recently, uh, also to include you know other types of new risks like AI, for example. So looking at your or AI applications and systems. So I think it's the, looking at those frameworks that are the next level that also can allow me to do to build continuous maturity. I think that's probably the uh, the the first key thing. And that's a that's a major one because that governs a lot of other. Uh, things that you're going to do. Uh, I guess uh, the other piece is going to be, and I really like this because my background is in security operations and incident response. So, and I think this regulation really goes at that at that critical uh, function in organizations, which I think is can be you know inconsistently implemented or or maybe not even implemented or, or at the most outsourced, which is your ability to detect a, an incident and, and respond to it. So you're establishing security operations procedures and capabilities, um, you're testing them, uh, within, and that could be a combination of you know, having a, an outsourced partner that monitors it, but having an in-house incident response uh, and investigative capability. Uh, you know, there's many ways for an organization to meet that guideline, but the key thing is uh, having it, right? And then not just collecting the logs, but being able to detect something, uh, identify it properly, triage it and respond to it and, and fully understand the problem is where many organizations you know, need to, I think, really need to take a heavy focus area. Uh, because as you mentioned, there's some timelines there for you know, reporting incidents, but if you can't detect them, then you're not going to be able to report them in time. So I think this really drives both risk management as part of that 
in particular incident response improvement. <laughs> Um, that's really helpful. Um, one thing on my mind is is really, you know, how should customers start um, preparing for NIST two? What's the checklist that they should they should follow? We, we've talked, you know, that it's um, a piece of legislation that doesn't mandate specific controls, um, but actually looks f for you to self assess um, and consider what new procedures and policies you need or you may need. You know how how can our customers best prepare themselves as as we move into this um, implementation phase? Yeah, I, I think it starts with uh, you know first you know the executive buy-in, of course, and, and I think well with the level of impact that this can have, that should be you know should be on the mind of every executive and board member in all these essential sectors. So I, I think that's there, but if it's not, that's a, that's a, certainly getting on the same sheet it is is important to see so with the with the executive suite. I think you know more practically or or after that, let's say, is doing that gap assessment, that maturity assessment against those the frameworks of choice, ISO, NIST, uh, other guidelines that you would like to use uh, to assess your maturity. And it's not just that point in time assessment; it's a continuous approach. So uh, that's that's an an important next step. And part of that is is understanding your risk. And that comes from intelligence. You know, so that comes from a threat intelligence capability. And that's certainly um, some areas where uh, your Trellix can help with that assessment as well as with the continuous risk assessment. So the maturity piece is one part, but the continuous understanding of your risk is also, I think, a, a second part that organizations may not be as strong in. So having a, a threat intelligence service or, or capability um, that allows you to understand your risk and then informing your your maturity assessment because that also that's going to tell you your risk assessment is going to tell you where do you need to beef up the controls let's say and I, you know some of the things that we do within Trellix, which may not be as well known we we have actually a a very robust assessment capability assessment service uh, and a growing threat intelligence uh, risk assessment service that. Uh, organizations can adopt for for that very purpose, certainly to help you get started and then continue to assess maturity for the long run. Yeah, and I think maybe one thing that I would I would add to that, you know, with an eye to regulators and enforcement and compliance is, as you're doing this gap analysis, as you're perhaps bringing more products and services on board from vendors to help you improve your posture, it's really critical to to document your procedures and your protocols. Um, as as a current state and as a developed state. That's gonna be important if in the event there's ever an investigation and it's just good, good um, housekeeping uh, to bear in mind. And I think you have to, that will help demonstrate that you're, you're, your clients, but also will inform your your testing and inform your your, your teams, keep your, you know, so as you bring more people on, you know, staff, staff uh, changes or you know, grows, you know, you have to have that that consistent ability, and and I do think that's the resilient aspect here, which is you know consistent uh, maturity improvement, consistent the capability improvement. Uh, that's really, I think, a big uh, big part of this what the regulation is trying to drive, or the direct, if not. And something that was um, top of mind for me is. Are there specific sort of buckets of risk areas that that you see um, what uh, Trellix can really help um, companies and customers uh, comply with NIST two? Are there? You've talked a little bit about the threat intelligence piece, but um, are there other um, sort of buckets of, of problem areas that that you think um, uh, organisations should be focusing on? Yeah, yeah, definitely, and it could be a, a lot of things. You know, one of the reasons why. Uh, organizations, why, why our customers choose Trellix is because of that broad security in your portfolio, you know, controls at the endpoint, email, data, network, and of course, for security operations, you know, we provide a lot of different types of solutions that, you know, when you're looking at your controls, no matter what it is, uh, in that in those areas, we, we have a, a large portfolio to help, um, you know, fill those gaps. But in particular, I think there's a couple of areas where organizations need to focus where we've seen customers you know, starting to close the gaps, let's say, with some of our some of our technology, one of which is around ransomware. I like to say ransomware resilience because 
again, fitting in with the, with the spirit of the directive, building resilience. Uh, you know, ransomware is the top threat to any essential sector. And that's a combination of things. That's email security. Uh, it's, good, it's strong endpoint security. And of course, it's strong incident response and preparation capabilities. And you know, our ransomware readiness assessments where we can do an exercise with the customer, really important to you know, build up your IR capability and see where you are. Uh, market leading, industry leading email security. So even if you're using a you know, built-in security like a Defender, uh, Defender for email, uh, you know, augmenting that with Trellix uh, email threat protection is a very strong security solution for, and it built really to detect some of the common entry points for, for ransomware, spear pushing, you know, business email compromise, uh, all, all those areas are uh, where your know, ransomware gets a foothold in the business. So testing it, uh, re react, um, beefing up your procedures, testing your readiness, and then I think uh, really closing the gaps on email and collaboration apps, right? That's where the other entry point, you, as you collaborate across different uh, businesses between sectors, you're using Teams, you're using Web apps, you're using different types of uh, you're sharing applications. That's another area where our email collaboration security solution uh, really closes the the malware protection gaps and it helps you build that that ransomware uh, resilience. Um, you know, speaking of just a couple more things, I I think the the, the other key area is, is is in the SOC, right? And, and again, another reason why customers choose Trellix is about you know purpose built uh, AI capabilities. Purpose built by security analysts for security analysts, and you know we have a goal which is no alert left behind. We have built in uh, Trellix Wise into our SecOps platform Helix, as well as our endpoint detection response, so that uh, even if you're a small organization, don't have a lot of uh, you know, highly skilled individuals, or don't have a large staff, uh, you can use uh, you know, we're taking you can use those products with the AI functionality to help you help both detect, analyze, triage, and respond to, to alerts. So I think that's really built for uh, organizations that need to start building up their SecOps. Uh, and then finally, Chris, I think it's, it's in that area where uh, security is just now you know, starting to become very, very important, which is in OT. We mentioned it a few times. Uh, you know, we have some of the most, we'll say, validated solutions, especially at the endpoint level across all the different SCADA you know, providers. Um, network security solutions that help you, you know, provide cross-boundary protection as well as detect threats you know, that you where you can't put an endpoint security solution. So I think uh, those are the three major areas. I would say ransomware resilience, SecOps improvement, and OT security. Where Trellix really, um, we'll say, shines. That. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Mike. Um, and you know we're. We're, you know, upskilling our, our customers now. We want to get into customer conversations about compliance, about risk management, about, you know, improving your threat detection capabilities, your resilience. You know, from my perspective, it's going to be a movable feast. Not every country is going to implement this regulation um, at the same time. You need to be aware that as a directive, uh, it actually requires national legislation and countries move at different speeds. So it's not going to be sort of a big bang that NIST 2 immediately enters into force and will be enforced from mid-October. We're going to see a gradual um, development of uh, firstly identification of critical infrastructure players by, by governments and then secondly enforcement of these rules. So there is some time, but, you know, it's important to start preparing now. Oh, absolutely, and that those timelines are, are coming, you know, coming due. Let's say, and I think organizations you know, have been preparing, but it's time to certainly time to accelerate. And I think you know, with that, you know, we you know call to action for you know, for our listeners here is you know, we're having a uh, a solution webinar uh, on the 16th of October where we're going to talk more in depth about some of those key solutions that I mentioned. You know how we can really help you accelerate your preparedness and your readiness. For uh, this two for the NIST two directive implementation, and with that, right. I, I'd like to like to thank Chris uh, for your insights and you know, for all our, our our listeners here. Hope we found this uh, valuable. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it was a pleasure, and look forward to the webinar on October sixteenth. Thank you.